Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this week's Kerbal Space Program video featuring an SSTO with a twist. Kind of. The twist being that while almost all SSTOs built in this game feature either the rapier engines or a combination of jets and chemical rockets, this one can take a payload to orbit using just the aerospike engine that you saw just there. Well, six aerospike engines to be precise. The reason behind this was because I wanted to just see if it was possible to have a single stage ship with actual functionality that doesn't require air breathing engines. I don't think it's something too many people have done on YouTube, at least not in a horizontal takeoff aircraft form factor. Although to be fair there is a good reason behind this never being done before, namely that it is far more efficient to use air breathing engines for this sort of thing. Um, you could do this mission I'm doing here with a much smaller craft if rapiers or jets were used, but I wanted to do it for the challenge and it also gives me an excuse to talk about the engines I went with, the Aerospike, and why their real life counterparts often form the basis for potential Earth SSTOs. One of the more interesting quirks of the engine, as I'm sure you'll be aware, is its appearance. All the other engines in KSP, bar the ion engines, have the traditional bell-shaped nozzle for the exhaust. The bell is designed to guide the exhaust in the right direction, that is, you know, to move the exhaust in the opposite direction to the direction of the ship itself. The momentum distribution of the exhaust is random, as in it will just thrust in any direction it can, so the bell exists to ensure that the exhaust can only escape in the correct direction. It's also important for the exhaust pressure to be equal to the surrounding ambient air pressure, and that's why lower atmosphere engines have narrower bells to keep the exhaust pressure high, while the upper atmosphere engines have much broader bells to keep the pressure low. Uh, Scott Manny did a nice video on this if you wanted to know more about that, but as a result, an engine designed for flight at sea level will see reduced efficiency as it ascends higher through the air. For an SSTO, that's not really ideal. Enter the Aerospike. Now think of an Aerospike as an inverted bell-shaped engine. The shape the spike forms is the inverted form of a traditional bell. Now at lower altitudes, the air pressure is higher and pushes exhaust gases against the spike, which mimics a bell-shaped engine with a narrow opening since the exhaust is under quite a bit of pressure. However, as the rocket ascends, the air pressure against the exhaust reduces, and the gas isn't pressed quite so closely to the spike. This ends up mimicking a bell nozzle with a broader opening, and effectively means that the virtual bell shape formed by the spike and the air pressure changes shape and adapts depending on the altitude, keeping the engine operating at a maximally efficient level at all altitudes, pretty much. That's why the engine gets its name too. The bell is formed by the air and the spike, so it's called the aerospike. So some of you may be wondering at this point, Matt, you rocketeer buccaneer, why on earth do we even use bell-shaped engines in the first place if the aerospike is clearly the superior design? Well, I'm glad you asked that, random viewer. The biggest disadvantage of aerospikes is the extra weight required for the spike. While there's obviously a weight saving in the fact there's no bell, it takes a huge amount to keep the spike itself cool since it spends the entire flight being blasted by rocket exhaust. Furthermore, too much cooling can reduce performance below theoretical level since it can reduce the pressure against the nozzle. In addition to this, aerospikes work relatively poorly between Mach 1 through 3 due to the fact that the airflow around the vehicle will have reduced pressure, therefore resulting in the thrust being, you know, reduced. Another issue is the fact that the aerospike, it just, it remains a concept. You know, while, while tests have gone a little further than the Sabre engine, which is the one uh, that's going to be on the Skylon, and it's the one that the Rapier and KSP is based on, uh, the aerospike hasn't actually ever been flight tested. Uh, they mounted one on the back of an SR-71, uh, back in the day to test it sort of in flight like a kind of flying wind tunnel, but an aircraft has never flown powered by, a, by a, an aerospike. I forgot the name of the engine just then. <laughs> But there is a beautiful shot of our ship deploying its payload. I didn't feel like I needed to talk too much because I guess you guys could have figured out what was good. This is a recurring topic, isn't it? I'll kind of just I'll go on a little tangent without looking at the screen. Then something's happening and I'll use the excuse of, well, I guess you guys can figure out what's going on. But I don't know. Is it really an excuse? I feel like you guys can easily figure out what's going on here. But I'm deploying a, a little probe. Uh, I actually uh, posted on Discord where people want me to send it. And uh, I didn't listen to anyone's suggestion. And I just sent it to the mun because I thought, you know what? I want this I want this video to be about the spacecraft, not just the probe it launches. So we've got a little probe there that we can take to the mum, but it has a huge amount of delta V. And I mean, if we'd used an ion engine in there as opposed to a, uh, a spark <laughs> engine, is that what it's called? Um, it could have got even further. But, you know, like I wanted to keep this limited to the, the spacecraft itself, not the payload it deploys. So you can see me here turning around to face this target here because I thought, well, I've showcased it showing an ability to deploy payloads. We can also go and visit a space station as well and show off the docking port that I built into it. So I deliberately put ourselves in a in a position where we could then dock with our 
with a space station as soon as we deployed our probe. And we're going to be docking to this one, the NS station, which I guess stands for non-stop state. Well, I just say I guess. I know it stands for non-stop station because it was constructed in one mission, as in I had an SSTO with all the modules on the ground. The SSTO launched, put a module up in space, landed, refueled itself with a truck, and then loaded itself back up. So there was no reverting to space plane hangar, basically. It was since extended by a space shuttle mission. That was the additional orange fuel tank. But other than the second orange tank, everything was done in one mission so i am exceptionally proud of that video um i don't know why that's this, I don't know why i'm talking too much about this but there we go now i guess if like i said earlier this is a sort of soft recreation of the venture star just because the venture star is the closest we've really come to a i guess it's probably the closest we've come to an ssto program as well i guess the skylon and the roto rocket is that what it's called? The rotor rocket? The one that's like a helicopter and a rocket. I think it's pretty cool. I'm pretty sure it's called the rotor rocket, but I'm getting distracted here. I'd pretty, I'd say the Venstar came pretty damn close to being a working program, and that would have used uh, an aerospike engine, but it would have been a linear aerospike, not a toroidal aerospike. Uh, instead of being kind of a, a spike shape, you know, a toroidal shape, it would have been a long, thin, it would, it would have been a wedge as opposed to a spike, is what I'm trying to say here. Uh, so this is kind of a soft recreation of the Venture Star. It looks kind of similar to a Venture Star as well. It's a little bit longer because the Venture Star relied on having a lifting body, which, you know, whilst the Mark II space plane parts do have a lifting, you know, they are lifting body pieces, it's nowhere near powerful enough, really. So I had to make this thing a little bit longer uh, to have a more controllable ship once we re-enter the atmosphere. But we can just cut away from the ship and show off the probe that it deployed. Um, just because... I kind of wanted to just drag this video out. No, not well. I guess I could. I guess it does extend the video. You get a little bit more content this week rather than just me going to orbit. But uh, I thought I'd go visit the Mun. In fact, I thought I'd go and visit the Mun machine, uh, which is actually quite a popular video. Um, after well, my views my views have been in a bit of a slump following all the drama and shenanigans. I'm pretty sure the PewDiePie N word shenanigans. No, I'm not going to say that word because screw you. You can't make me. <laughs> I said it on a live stream. Got a lot of flax. I'm like, you know what? We're trying to be, we're trying to be family friendly in the, by the way, I said it on a live stream in context. I didn't just say it. Now I realize how bad that might have sounded. I kind of said, oh, PewDiePie said this word. Uh, and I got a lot of flack for just that. So I'm like, maybe I shouldn't, no, I'm just not going to say it in context. It's not, it's not my place to have these philosophical debates about when and when it isn't acceptable to use a swear word in context of so here we are landing <laughs> moving away from that here we are landing on the mun uh nearly nearly got to the mun lander mun, mun rover in one go but undershot slightly so we had to do some a little bit of skimming around like i mentioned earlier we have loads and loads of delta v in this probe because i it wasn't necessarily designed exclusively for the mun but since it has we've got a lot of fuel basically <laughs> so i'm trying to say here so at this point you might notice that um obviously this video has been all sped up to make it a sort of tolerable length you may have noticed i've sped slowed down the footage here so you can see it more easily haven't done that actually the frame rate dropped to seven <laughs> when i got here i guess just the lighting and all the different parts on the mun rover just tanked my performance and i use fraps as well which has an enormous effect on a frame rate like shadow play and bandy cam and action cam they don't tend to have that much of an impact on gameplay performance not fraps though i mean the payoff with fraps is the fact that the you know the video quality is the best that you can get out of all of them like if you look at my videos done with shadow play and then look at the videos with fraps there's just absolutely no comparison so that's why i kind of go with the more performance hungry bigger storage you know bigger file sizes of fraps because i feel like ultimately it's worth it so you have our little kerbal disembarking from the mun machine to go take a look at the probe and we thought hey we could use this to, I mean, this is purely now the fiction of the Mun Rover base because this isn't part of KSP. We're like, hey, we can program this to go take a look over this ridge that our, our Mun Rover can't quite see over. And we don't want to do a recon mission with it just because, I don't know, maybe the, maybe the ground's stable or it's too dangerous for it to traverse. I didn't really think too much into this. I thought, yeah, we'll just, we'll do a pretend reconnaissance mission down into this crater here. We can do some more science down there and then report back. And we have enough fuel here, actually, to get back to the Mun machine as well if we wanted to. But they're doing a nice little touch down there. Oh, bada boom. There we go. Beautiful. Now, unfortunately, I tried transmitting some stuff back. Apparently, this thing doesn't have enough electric, electric charge to actually transmit stuff, unfortunately. I assumed it would just cut the transmission and, retran and restart the transmission once it had enough power. No, apparently, if you run out of power during a transmission, well, that's just it. And... Uh, our solar panels couldn't charge the batteries faster than they were being depleted, so we couldn't transmit anything. So, luckily, we are by the Mun machine, so I suppose we could use the the rover's 
uh, electric charge and you know antenna to, anten- antennas to uh, transmit our data back. But eh, whatever. I don't know. It's not that. It's not important. It was, the, the probe was just there to showcase the uh, the cargo capacity of this ship, and I think we did a pretty nice job of doing that. So, I mean, you may notice that, like I said earlier, if we'd used jet engines, we could have had a much smaller craft. This thing is an absolutely enormous space plane for what it is, as in just going into low carbon orbit, deploying a very small probe, and that being about it. Like we have virtually no fuel left, so we have just enough to decircularize, and we're going to try and get back to the space center's runway. Uh, without expending any fuel because I just kind of felt it was more realistic to do it that way. If the Venture Star did end up becoming a thing, it would probably have separate engines for orbital maneuvers, much like the Skylon would. But uh, I don't know. I, I just kind of read the Wikipedia page and it didn't say anything about having separate orbital engines, so I'm guessing it probably wouldn't. But actually, no, it probably would. What am I talking about? I've just kind of I just kind of ended up staring at my wall and not really thinking about what I was saying. I'm sorry for that. I apologise profusely for that momentary lapse in concentration. But uh, yeah, aiming back for the runway. I tend to aim for my uh, the um, my trajectory, as in my orbital line, uh, to sort of impact the peninsula to the east of the Kerbal Space Centre. Now we're deploying the air brakes here. Uh, they are actually necessary this time. It's not just to make sure we slow down fast enough to actually get to the runway, although that that is part of the reason why, but also because this thing is actually aerodynamically unstable when we re-enter the atmosphere. Uh, with all the fuel tanks empty, it's the centre of mass is a bit too far forward, particularly in the upper atmosphere. Once we get into the thicker part of the atmosphere, the air is thick enough where we can just ride along nice and stable. But uh, for the upper parts, you need to have the brakes deployed, otherwise you'll start entering a flat spin. But the air brakes create a nice amount of drag towards the back of the plane and keep it stable. And uh, yeah, blazing through the cloud layer there, luckily we have quite a nice resilience to our heat, so it wasn't an issue. We never even had a temperature gauge show up, I don't think. So all in all, fairly nice landing. Managed to get that nailed first time, which is always nice when that happens. Yeah, you can see it kind of oscillating back to like left and right there, wanting to enter a flat spin. But just make sure your nose down, sort of keep yourself pointing prograde. And uh, you shouldn't enter a stall if we just keep speed nice and high. And then now we're all lined up just to play brakes. And uh, there we go. We're all touched down. So, yeah, nice and short mission. A uh, little something, something a little different. I kind of I've wanted to make a video about aero spikes for a while, but never really knew about the right formats. I feel like I should mention, actually, by the way, people will probably mention this in the comments if I don't. Uh, this may have been a replica of the Venture Star, kind of. The Venture Star would have taken off vertically like a rocket. I feel like I should just say that now to save my cred. But enough of all of that on screen now. On the top left-hand side of the screen is a link to uh, all my all my other SST videos. Top right was specially selected for you by YouTube's algorithm bots. And bottom right is just my latest upload, whatever that might be. So other than that, Twitter, Patreon, Discord, all in the description. Hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.